Hi, my name is Jean Troyan. I'm an executive communication coach and trainer, and I'm really happy to be talking with Adam today. We talk about why I came to the Czech Republic almost 25 years ago. I even get emotional about Pilsen, and also why we should start presenting better and how we can do it. I'm looking forward to it. A to není normální. Ahoj, já jsem Adam Zběčuk, vítám vás u dalšího pokračování videoblogu Jak se podniká profesionálům na volné noze. A dneska to bude trochu jinačí, protože to bude moje i celého blogu, premiéra v angličtině. So hello. <laughs> Hi. Uh, hi Jean, nice to meet you. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Jean Trojan is our first uh, native speaker, English speaking guest. Uh, but freelancing in Czech Republic since 2006. 2006. So that's, that's, I believe, the date when Navolne Noze actually started the oh, year. Wow. <laughs> and way longer time than probably, you know, 90% of Czech freelancers are Czech freelancers. Probably, yeah. Um, but not just this amount of time being freelancer, but even longer time being in Czech Republic. Is that correct? Over 20 years. January 19th, 1995, my plane <laughs> landed. Yeah, exactly. Almost 25 years. Okay. Yeah, it's amazing. And yeah, I never thought, you know, I would be here this long. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's probably true for most of people who stay for such a long time that it was not planned. What did, what did brought you here actually uh, back these days? It's funny, I mean, 25 years ago I was much younger. <laughs> That's the big thing and you know when you're in your 20s you just kind of are open to new opportunities and uh, I was a free spirit and I was living in Portland, Oregon. I had a great job. I worked as an outside sales team leader for one of the biggest independent bookstores in the United States. And it was really a dream job for me because libraries and schools and institutions would come to us and they would say, here are pages of titles of books. Can you find them for us in your bookshop? And we had, I don't know, 800,000 books under one roof in our bookstore. Nothing was digital, of course. It was the 90s, early 90s. And so my job was to go around and shop for books, you know, <laughs> find the books. And it was fantastic. But I talked to a guy who had been to the Czech Republic. It actually was Czechoslovakia at the time, 1993. Yeah. And um, in 94, I really started considering going because he said, go now. Don't wait, because in a few years it'll just be another normal European country. But this is a country in transition, you know, it's just, it's, things change daily. So I really thought about it. And so I went to San Francisco and got my certification to be a teacher, you know, because that's what everybody did when they came to this country. Got it in August of 94. In January of 95, I got on a plane, a one-way ticket when you could buy those. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing. You know? <laughs> I didn't know anything about this country. I didn't know any of the language. I didn't know anything. I came by myself. When I think about it now, I think that was really crazy. You know, that was just, <laughs> but I was young and I thought, well, I'll just stay for a year and see what happens. And I had gotten a job in Pilsen, not in Prague. So I lived in Pilsen first off. And it was January. It was, we were in the middle of the longest winter since 1940. So it was incredibly cold. And I remember whenever I, I smell coal, I think of that time of Pilsen in 1995. And uh, it was magical, really. It was a magical time. It was not to be replicated. I'll give you one example of how magical it was. So I had a friend, Rob, a Canadian guy, And we decided we needed some culture, so we went to the opera in the Thiel uh, Opera House there. And we went and we hated it, and it was awful. And so at intermission, we left. 
And we went to the Shatna, you know, and the, the old ladies there are like, no, 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 they're trying to tell us, no, 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 you know, it's not over yet, you don't take your coats. But we were done, we got our coats, we left. And we went to a, uh, our local pub, and I don't know what the name of the pub was, but we called this pub the 690. Because at the time, a half liter of beer cost six crowns and 90 hellers. <laughs> so we went to our 690, and um, we got there, and the waiter was uh, trying to tell us, because of course we didn't speak Czech, and they had, nobody spoke English, and it was, but we always made it. And he was trying to tell us, sorry, it's closed for a private party, you know, somebody's having a celebration. And we could see the people in the, the U shaped table having a celebration. Somehow we talked him into letting us have just one beer, you know, and then we would leave. So we sat at the end of this celebration table having our beer. And at the time, being a Canadian and being an American in Pilsen in 1995 was unique. You know, it was, I would walk down the street and I walked differently. People would look like, wow, she's different, you know. <laughs> So we were talking English, of course, and having our beer, and the people at the celebration came over eventually and said, nah, come on, come join us, you know. None of it was in English, but we just figured it all out. And we ended up spending the entire evening with this group of people. It was a birthday party, and the man who was having the birthday was named Felix, I will never forget, and he was about 70 years old. And we drank and had a great time, and. Eventually it was time to go, and we decided, Rob and I, the Canadian, that we would stand up. So we stood up in front of Felix and everybody in, at the table, and we sang Happy Birthday to Felix. And it makes me emotional now even to think about it. And when we finished Happy Birthday, there were tears streaming down Felix's face. And it was like, wow, this is such an experience, you know. This would never happen anywhere else. And that kind of experience happened all the time. You know, it was just like one of so many. We were unique. The Czech people were unique to us. So, and everything changed daily. So it was magical. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time history these days, right? So yeah. That, uh, you know, we are here. Letna is probably... 50% foreigners. Yeah, that's <laughs> it right. It seemed to me, at least sometimes. Uh, no, it's nothing is, special anymore. Yeah, well, you know? no, not yeah. really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but still, uh, you know, everybody was teacher of English. I also remember this uh, in the late 90s. Mm. That's when I first actually uh, got to meet expats. Uh, but what brought you towards what you do now? Yeah, so obviously I stayed longer than a year than my plan and I kept getting better jobs and eventually I was working for a, an Austrian bank, Bank Austria Kodanstalt, probably nobody remembers it, and I was working in HR in their learning and development department and one of my jobs was organizing the new employee orientation day onboarding they call it now and this day was all of the the board and the the directors they all had presentations throughout the whole day each of them had a, I don't know, 30 minute presentation and these poor people you know they're just bored to tears information overload you can imagine the the slides were all text and it was just and I remember looking at this thinking this is terrible you know this this is awful, this should change, you know. And so that's when I first, the spark hit me that something, there's a problem and I think I can fix it. I was five years at the bank, uh, 2004 I had a baby and so I was on maternity leave and that's when I really thought, maybe I should do something, you know, to change this situation because it's horrible. I saw it everywhere, these presentations. And I am now, an executive communication coach and trainer. But I can tell you honestly, I made it up. I mean, nobody was doing this then. I created this title in 2006, not knowing you know, that I, what I would be doing today. But I decided, okay, I'm gonna be a presentation coach and trainer, I'm gonna change this. 
And I thought one of the first things that I should do is build awareness. You know, I think that everybody just thought presentations are supposed to be boring. You know, we just have to get through it somehow and that's the way it is and we can't do anything about it. And so I wanted to build awareness. And one of the first things I did was create a slideshow. If you remember SlideShare, I don't think anybody uses it anymore. I, I think it's still Is it still around? Yeah. Oh, okay. I used to do a lot of things on SlideShare and my presentation was called um, Presentations in the Czech Republic Still Suck. <laughs> <laughs> and I was showing and talking about in these slides how bad it is and that it needs to change. Why does it need to change? And I got a lot of traffic because I, I pissed a lot of people off, you know, for them, yeah, for me to say. They are still boring. I know, aren't they? there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. But so I started to build this awareness and then I decided I want to target a specific kind of people to, to help. And I decided on the IT community. I decided technical people, they have the passion for their topic and they have the knowledge. They know what they're talking about, but they have a problem communicating it. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, that's where I want to focus. And trainers were usually afraid of these people, you know, because they were different. You know, and they talked about stuff Geeks. that nobody knew. Geeks. Yeah, Nerds. they're strange. And so trainers kind of shied away from from getting to help these people. So. I started going to conferences. I started going to meetups. I started to meet people. And I think, and I think this is important for freelancers that you can't just say, okay, now I'm a presentation coach and I'm an expert and I'm going to show everybody what to do. For me, it was like six years of learning, talking to people, listening to people, finding out what they need, how I can help them, observing them. And that was the most valuable thing that I did. And this is how I got involved in the Web Expo community, for example. Dave Ruzius, I have to give full credit to him. He was, in 2008 we met, and he was starting a co-working movement. He wanted people to start, I didn't even know what co-working was when he said it. And he started these jellies where we would meet once a month, I think, and we would all get together in one cafe and we would work that whole day together, different people. This is where I met Václav Stopa. This is where I met Sharka, Lukáš Plihal, all of these people that eventually were the Web Expo community started there. And I think Dave Ruzius needs a lot of credit for that. And so that's when I got into the community and I think I was accepted because I wasn't trying to sell them anything. You know, I wasn't handing out my business card and saying, Hey, I want to, I want you to pay me to help with the presentations. I was there to learn and, and open to, to knowing. And I know most of these people to this day. And yeah, in fact, that's, that's most probably as we've discussed this, uh, before, uh, the interview, that's probably also as the, where we met, yeah, even exactly. though we were not <laughs> able to figure it exactly yeah. out how it, how it went. Uh, but I remember these days and the, the first uh, Web Expo conferences and you've helped me uh, with my still, I do have presentations that suck, but uh, <laughs> at least they hopefully suck a little bit less than before. Uh, and there's not that much text anymore. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, the, these were these were crazy, crazy days, and uh, I think actually, uh, even though a lot of presentation is still boring, I think you've helped, and you you should also take the credit for uh, changing the standard for these conferences at least, mm. because uh, there's there's a difference before and these these days how, how presentations look like not just on web expo That's, but yeah you, know, you can see it through the bar camp scene and, yeah, and so yeah, on exactly. that, that people kind of you know thought okay if david grudel can do it <laughs> oh yes david I and i work together yes exactly and and so that was this exciting time when it was all building and i think and that's where it led me to start working for it companies for example. Um, but what's interesting now, so we have what, 13 years later, um, I work mostly with executives in multinational organizations. And because it, it's clear to me that you got to start here with the change. 
you know, that these guys make the policies, these guys are doing the town hall talks, they're the ones, they're the examples, so this is who I work with now. And, and I think that's where the biggest change can come from. But what's interesting is I have one client that has a branch in the Czech Republic. Other than that, I don't work here at all. I work in other parts of Europe, I work in Dubai, in India, and now I just had my first workshop in the United States, in Detroit. <laughs> and it was kind of like, you know, coming full circle. It was great to, to see this expanding so much. That's interesting. And, and you still, you know, uh, do it all from here or how much, you know, you know it's like there's communication needs probably personal involvement on the spot, right? So a lot of traveling. Lots of traveling, yeah. But I have Skype clients. I have clients I've never met in person that we just work, uh, individual coaching, we just work together. I have workshops in Malaysia. I've never been to Malaysia, but this company I work for has a telepresence room. They all sit in Malaysia. I have to get up really, really early because of the time difference. And I sit in this telepresence room and we have a workshop. So six people and me and it works. It's fabulous. I don't have to get on a plane. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, but does it, you know, what, what about, I don't know, the, the culture differences, for example, isn't it kind of uh, tricky to, you know, it's like, I don't really know much about Malaysia, but I, I suppose it might be different. It is different. And India is different and Dubai is different, but Dubai and Malaysia have something in common that their culture, their place is full of lots of different cultures. Very few people are actually from Dubai, yeah. you know, they're all a mixture. And I think with presentations, simple, focused, clear, engaging communication is universal. Nobody wants to be bored to tears. Everybody wants to be able to understand it and to get it and, and enjoy it. So for me, that, that, that works across the board. Yeah, so the, you know, the basics are the same. Yes, and I think it is basic. You know, I don't think we need huge different technology to make this something, you know, it's really, it's not rocket science. And we need to go back to, you know, why am I doing this and how can I engage people? That's uh, definitely, definitely true for many presentations. Should they actually be here at all? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Is this a presentation? The biggest complaint I get from clients is, I don't have any time. I spend all of my day in meetings and most of those presentations, they should have been an email. You know, they should not have ever been presented because they're standing up there reading their slides to me, you know. This is a waste of time. So I, one of the first questions I ask my clients to ask themselves is, why am I presenting this? Why is this not an email? Why is this not a meeting? Why is this not a conversation? Why am I going through the trouble of creating a presentation for this? No. And the answer is, usually, like what, what do you think is the problem? Well, usually we're only transferring information. Right? I have some information. I'm going to use 30 minutes of your valuable time to throw all of that information at you and you figure it out. You know, I, there's no reason for me to present it. So that's why we have technology. You know, send me a document, send me the slides. Everything's on the slides anyway. So if it's just an information transfer, cancel the presentation because that's not what it should be. I think that's one of the basic things we should be asking. And when do you think the, there's the right time for a presentation? What, what makes it, uh, what, what should be presented? If I want to persuade you to do something different, for example, if I wanted to create change, I need to present that. I can't mm. just send you the slides and say, okay, you know, because you don't want to change, you know, nobody wants to change. So that's one of the opportunities we have that there's a reason to do this. I want to sell you something or I want to make you change something. Then I should be presenting it. But we're not always doing that, you know. I, yeah, that's, that's, that's like a, a really <laughs> cool point. I never, well, it's like really kind of, hmm. <laughs> <hitting the lights. laughs> Good. Yeah, yeah. That's what I try to do, you know, um, change mindset. 
we we uh, we met also, as I said, uh, on the present on the WebExpo presentation. Uh, for the freelancers, uh, I believe presentation skills might be even more important than for employees. Do you agree, or how do you perceive uh, that the role of presenting and communication in general for, for freelancing businesses, how, is it different or? Well, I think, I mean, the hardest thing for me when I became a freelancer was getting clients. You know, I'd been an employee forever and all of a sudden you're on your own. And I think not necessarily just presentations, but the way you communicate, the way you present yourself, you know, when f people first meet you, do they want to work with you? All of that is so important because I think it goes beyond presenting and, and I work beyond presenting. It's communication in general and freelancers don't have, you know, the, the organizational brand to stand behind them and, oh yeah, we know DHL, you know, or yeah, we know Honeywell. This is some unknown person and why would we want to work with you? Well, you better be able to answer that in a very clear, concise, focused way. So I think it's absolutely important for freelancers to, to figure out how they communicate, what they do, why they do it, why it's important for the customer or potential customer. And what do you think are the most common mistakes uh, people, like especially freelancers, I mean, especially freelancers repeat? Or... Assumptions, I think, is one of the biggest problems that we have. I assume, number one, that you have to listen to me. You don't have to listen to me. You know, especially if I'm presenting and there's an audience there. We have these, you know, the minute that you start to bore me, I'm going to work on my phone or I'm going to do something else or I'm going to watch a movie because I can. <laughs> you know, I don't have to listen to you. So I think one of the assumptions we make is that the world, they forget the world has changed. And I have a lot of choices just sitting here in this seat, whether I want to listen to you or not. So we have to be more attractive than whatever is on that device. And that's tough. You that's know. true. <laughs> that's true. You, can, you can see it on pretty much every conference, right? Yeah, like, of course. If most of the people is looking like this, then probably the presentation you should do something else. Yeah. You know, if is, you're presenting, is not, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> and I don't think that the solution to this, I had an argument with a guy on LinkedIn because uh, he was complaining about millennials, you know, how millennials are so rude and millennials are, well, he'll be in the meeting room and he'll be presenting and everybody's looking at their devices and they're ignoring him. And that's terrible. And he was blaming it on young people. Millennials aren't that young anymore, but he used that, that term. And I said to him, uh, it's not their fault, really. You really have to think the world has changed. You need to be more attractive than whatever they have on their device. And the solution is not banning the devices. Because I hear this from some corporations that say, so we're going to have a meeting and we're all going, I saw this on LinkedIn not long ago, we're going to have a box. Everybody puts their phone in the box for the meeting or they can't bring their notebooks. And I thought, no, that's, you know, that's childish for one. And maybe I want to make notes on my phone or I want to make notes on my notebook or I have some documents or something. So it's the presenter's job to make sure that I'm bringing value mm -hmm. to these people. And if I'm bringing value, they'll put the phone down and they'll put the notebook, they'll close the notebook. But I don't think the solution is banning devices. Yeah. Yeah. It's, sorry, it's too late. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably not changing the presentation for a better, right? No. I can, you know, not listen anyway. I'll just pretend. You know, that's what we did before. Yeah, I can remember. Yeah. We just pretended to listen. Yeah. And then... yeah. Uh, that's, that's totally, I, I can, you know, I, I saw a lot of these discussions, how millennials or even those younger ones are, you know, like, it's always like this, like, you know, it's like we can complain about the younger is not really, you know, doing the same stuff we did before. 
We didn't have the opportunity. Yeah, we, <laughs> I would do that. Anything yeah, <laughs> I mean, I have a 15 year old. I can completely see if you are raised with this kind of technology, you'd better have a really good alternative to have them put it down. You know, it has to be really attractive to have them put the device away. And it doesn't work to say, you know, you can't have your device anymore. Um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, uh, we have here uh, Robert's Freelance Way book where he also touches this kind of uh, topics uh, on how to you know, create your own brand and how to present yourself. Uh, would you give the audience like three or four tips what can be easily done in terms of getting better in this, some universal... It's interesting that you use that word, tips. Because so, lots of people ask me, just, you know, I just want the tips and tricks, you know. Well, uh, like, that's, that's <laughs> like format for such an interview. I don't yeah. think we can do more. <laughs> no, and, and the thing that I really like to hammer into my clients is that that doesn't work, really. I mean, I could like show you how to make a nice design for your slides or something. But for me, it's all about mindset. It's changing the way you think. Like we were saying earlier, you know, that you have to ask yourself, do I really need to present this? You know, that, that is one really important, maybe we could call it a tip. Yeah. You know, ask yourself that question. Is this a presentation or is this an information transfer and I don't have to bore people? Maybe another one would be, am I bringing value to this audience? Is there value that I'm giving them? Do I want them to do something? Is there a call to action? If there isn't, why are you up there? You know, if you're just throwing numbers at people and there's no decision to be made, there's no change that you want, that's not a presentation. Send them doc the document, have a meeting, you know, but don't make, I, that's the mistake we're making is we're wasting people's time and you're wasting your own time because you go through the trouble of creating the presentation and practicing and making the slides and doing all this stuff for an audience that's just going to be looking at their devices anyway. You know, so it's a, on both sides, a waste of time. So if one thing you could do is to really, before you do anything, don't write any content, don't even think about it, really think, is this necessary? Do I really need to present this? Because if it's not, then I'm going to save my time and I'm not going to bore people and I'm going to have a valuable meeting or a valuable conversation or write a, a valuable email. Find another form of communication and don't just rely on, well, yeah, I'm going to make a presentation and I'll make some slides. We, it's a trap. It's a habit, I think, that we've fallen into. Because we've thought about, you know, the world has changed. We have to think that, that we have to be giving value. And, and, but that's, that's probably, you know, is it, you know, where, where does it come from? Like, I think, you know, it's like, that's not, the world has changed, but, you know, nobody liked boring presentations earlier on. No, of course, we all hated it and we all dreaded it, but we didn't do anything about it. We accepted it. We accepted that normal, my favorite word, normal. It was normal that presentations were boring. And we just thought, well, you know, we just have to suffer through. And I think we have to more often be saying as the presenter, I'm not going to make them suffer through it, you know, because they don't have to. And they're not going to listen anyway if I create something boring. So that's what's really changed or it has to change is the acceptance. I talk about um, the audience, you know, voting with their feet. And like at a conference, you know, don't accept it. Go to the organizer afterward and say, that sucked. You know, those presentations were horrible. This is what I talk about in my TEDx talk. You know, don't just complain about it, but do something about it and find out how you can make a change and instead of just grumbling to your friends about how terrible the presentations were actually say to the organizers, you need to find a trainer, you need to do something else, you need to have different speakers because this is not acceptable. And do you think uh, over like, you know, not 
not talking about concrete like conferences like Web Expo, but but in general, do you think it got better uh, or so so? You know what's funny? I don't know. <laughs> I have a lot of work, so <laughs> you know. I think. I mean, it's good for me that it's not better yet. Uh, in fact, yesterday I filled my workshop calendar for 2020. I'm done. There's plenty of work. But I think what, what has changed, maybe presentations haven't gotten better, but audience expectations have changed with TED. TED is one of the big things that changed everything. In 2007, TED came out on the internet. Everybody could see it. Everybody sees TED Talks. Whenever I ask my clients, even ones that are, you know, finance people and you think, no, they don't know it. They know TED. They've seen the TED Talks. And so now we go to presentations and we think, so that's our bar. You know, that's our benchmark, a TED Talk. And then what we get is just yeah. not even close. So maybe presentations haven't gotten better, but they have to, you know, because expectations are so much higher. We didn't, we didn't see this before 2007. We didn't see these incredible talks and, and how good it could be. Yeah, I, I would think probably about some, I don't know, Apple keynotes or <laughs> Maybe. other kind of yeah. uh, special events and highlights. But TED Talks are definitely uh, raising the bars uh, oh, yeah. a, a lot. And, yeah, and not just true. conferences, you know, in corporations, people have higher expectations for how they're going to use their time, you know, and if they're going to spend their time watching this guy read his slides, they're not as tolerant, I think, anymore of that. I think, and you know, it's like I, I haven't been that much uh, active there to judge really, but I think the problem with the presentation starts at universities because they are usually yeah. the diverse ones. Yeah, this is, oh, this is bad, you know, because this is where it should be good. This is where people should learn how to give great presentations. And I remember, I don't know, six, seven years ago, I went to Cheve Ute and I said to them, I would like to help people at a younger stage, I see them when they're older and the damage is already done. And I would like to help university students, technical university students to help them. And I was volunteering. I wasn't asking for any money and they were not interested. I don't know about now. Hopefully they're doing something now, but yeah, if you, if you hear that, yes, <laughs> shame, shame, exactly. Shame. <laughs> it should start actually in younger in primary school. I think, I mean, that's, we learn how to present in kindergarten. We are presenting when we're five, six years old. It's not really a presentation, but we have a thing called show and tell. And every day you would bring something from home that was meant something to you. And you would be chosen for that day. And you would stand up in front of the group of kids and you would talk about why this thing was special to you and what this thing was. We're giving a presentation when we're five and that is all the way through school. And I don't know about now, but when I was at school, you constantly had to stand up and speak and present. Now for people like me, extroverts and everything, I loved it. My sister was ex that exact opposite and she was just, she hated it. And I don't know if she got any better at it. Nobody was really helping you at it, but you were forced to present. So I think maybe, maybe Americans aren't as afraid of doing this. As, as other cultures, but because we have so much practice, but it should start much earlier. I think that's, uh, I think, yeah, that's like the truth is, I think that's like, at least these days, I, I, I believe, uh, like the primary schools and maybe even the kindergartens it's changing. So it's even like starting here, but yeah, it will probably take time to actually <laughs> get from here. To, to get it fully into, you know, high schools and universities. It's mindsets of the teachers though, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. my son is at a Czech gymnasium and he will have to make a presentation. And so I will help him, of course. <laughs> and, but then he'll have to say to me, no, mom, they want everything on the slides. You know, they want all the words on the slides. And so 
So he knows that that's not how it should be, but he also knows what his teacher's expectations are, is you stand up there, everything's on the slide, and, and you read it, and that's what's being taught. You know, it's frustrating. Got it. <laughs> Hopefully this will also change for better. You, you mentioned the TEDx talk. Uh, I, I believe uh, you, will, you will find a link to this TEDx talk of yours uh, in the description uh, of, of our interview because I was there and it was brilliant and you should watch it as well after this interview. Uh, so thank you very much. I think we, we would be able oh, to... Oh, I have to say one more yeah. thing about TEDx. Because there's a backstory to this. Okay. Um, so I was asked to help with TEDx Haradets Kralove with speaker selection and speaker quality. So I would help the presenters. Renata, and I'm trying to remember her, Pavelkova, I think was her name. She worked at Symbio and I had worked there. And so she, helped me, she asked me to do this. So I did. And about two weeks before the event, she said, well, actually, could you speak to? <laughs> okay. But I had done at uh, Bar Camp Setting. I had done this rejecting normal there, kind of a form of it. And so then I, you know, I didn't have to start from scratch. And so I put it together and I ended up being the last speaker of the day. And so I did the talk and I got a horrible cold right before it, which was just awful. It's like my magnum opus, this is my thing. And then I get a cold and then so I was just happy I didn't cough the whole time. After my presentation, so it was over and I had given uh, the audience a call to action to say, meet at least three people before you leave. You know, you need to start meeting, talking to strangers and everything. And this kid came up to me, like 15 year old kid came up to me afterwards, Jakub. And he said, you changed my life. <laughs> he was great. He was so excited. And he, for some reason, he was bilingual. He was English, Czech, bilingual. But he went to a Czech school in Hradec Kralove. And he said, I want my classmates to see this presentation on YouTube, but they don't understand English. And so he decided in his free time for no money, he translated my entire talk on YouTube. The reason you see Czech subtitles there is because of Jakub, who was so excited, a teenager. And I thought I can't get better feedback than that, you know? And then afterwards, because it was such a great mix of people, I don't know if you remember, it was cheap. It was really a cheap yeah. TEDx talk. And that meant there were business people and artists and old people and students and this whole mixture. And at the after party, so many people came up to me and said, I've never spoken to a stranger in my life. I've never networked. And I met five new people tonight. And, you know, it was just, I want to thank you. And, and that is something that will always be so special to me that just that one event changed so many people. That's cool. You better watch it as well. And maybe you can also take uh, some change into your life. So, nebuď yes. normální. <laughs> exactly. Don't be normal. <laughs> Thank you very much once again. Thanks, Adam. It was great pleasure to have you here. And yeah, and check all the links. And we'll see you in the next interviews. Bye.